I'm going to now look at, continue looking at the basics of counting, our last section, and then we'll move on to 6.2. The last topic we're going to see is what we call tree diagrams. Okay, so when we're looking at a tree diagram, we want to look at all the possible choices to figure out that represent an outcome. So we solve this by creating what we call a tree diagram and the branches will represent the possible choices and the leaves are all the possible outcomes. And if we wanna know how many possible outcomes there are, we count up the leaves. So this example says, suppose you have an I love discrete math t-shirts that come in five different sizes, small, medium, large, extra large, and double XL. Each of the sizes come in four colors white, red, green, and black, except for XL, which only comes in red, green, and black, and the double XL, which only comes in green and black. What is the minimum number of shirts that a campus bookstore needs to have, I mean, it needs to stock to have at least one of each size and color available, okay? So this is going to be our shirt, okay? And then we're going to, the shirt is kind of the root of the tree. Then we're going to branch off with our sizes. So we'll start with small, medium, large, extra large, and double XL. Okay? And then it says each of them come in four colors. So small, I mean, excuse me, white, red, green, and black. So we'll do white, red, green, and black. Medium has one, two, three, four, white, red, green, and black. Large has one, two, three, four, white, red, green, and black. Sorry. Okay. But XL, one, two, three, only comes in red, green, and black. Okay. And double XL only comes in green and black. Okay, so these are all the possibilities. So if we want for um, us to have, excuse me, uh, one of each, the minimum amount, we have to have order at least these combinations. So for instance, this combination would be a black small, right? And so if we count these all up, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So the minimum of my of shorts, shirts that we must order is 17. And so this is a process we're going to use, which we call tree diagrams. And here is our solution, um, written a little neater than mine, but we see how we still get our 17 t-shirts. We will now move on to section 6.2, which is the pigeonhole principle. Okay. So, so what does the pigeonhole principle say? So we'll start by looking at an example. If a flock of 13 pigeons roosts in a set of 12 pigeonholes, one of the pigeonholes must have at least more than one pigeon. Okay? So let's look at some examples. Okay? So for instance, the we'll look at case B first. This is the case where there's one pigeonhole in each one. So that's we have 12. Okay? But since we have 13 pigeonholes, at least one has to go in another. Okay? But it might be the case that it's like A or C. In the case of A or C, okay, we might have empty pigeonholes, which is fine, but because we have those empty pigeonholes, they're going to be at least more than one in an additional pigeonhole. Okay? So, this brings me to the pigeonhole principle. Okay? The pigeonhole principle, excuse me, says that if k is a positive integer and k plus one objects, are placed into K boxes, then at least one box must contain two or more objects. To prove the pigeonhole principle, we're going to use a proof by contradiction. You might notice in your notes that yours says, um, sorry, go back. You might notice in your notes that yours might not say, uh, I think it says contraposition, but make that change. Okay. So suppose none of the K boxes 
has more than one object. So if I have K boxes, sorry, I keep doing that. So assume that none of the K boxes has more than one object. Okay? If that's the case, then the total number of objects would be K. But this contradicts the statement that we actually have K plus one objects. And so therefore, at least one box must contain more than one object. A corollary to this theorem is that a function from a set with k plus 1 objects to a set with k elements, excuse me, um, is not one-to-one. -one. So if we can recall, so if we think about we have a set x and we're mapping to a set y with some function. Okay? So say for instance, 1, 2, 3, I'm just putting some things. We have k plus 1 elements in my first set. Okay. Okay, but we only have k elements in this second set. All right? So let me make this a little neater. So let's say 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3. Right? When I map to be 1 to 1, everything has to map to one item from, k, from the x to the k, I mean x to the y. So this element might map here. This element might map here. This element might map here, but then what do we do with this element? This K plus first element, okay? And so therefore, we cannot have more from one set that goes to another. That's why we say it is not one to one. Okay. So we can think of this again as the pigeonhole principle. So this proof using the pigeonhole principle, we don't have enough elements, okay, to for it to map to. And so therefore, one of the elements has to map to another one of the elements, and therefore it cannot be one-to-one. -one. So now we're going to look at some different um, examples using the pigeonhole principle. Okay. So if I have a group of 367 people, there must be at least two with the same birthday. Why? Because there are only 366 possibilities to have birthdays. And this, of course, is a leap year. This happens to be a leap year. Okay. So if we have 367 people, assuming that everyone's birthday is on a different day, that extra one person has to be on the same birthday as another. In a group of 27 English letters, there must be at least two that begin with the same letter, okay? And that is because there are 26 letters in the English alphabet. Again, okay, this is the worst case scenario, but um, assuming every word that we have starts with a different letter, then that extra one, that 27th one, has to be a repeat. Sorry. How many students must be in a class to guarantee that at least two students the receive the same score on the final exam if it is graded on a scale from zero to um, 100? Okay. So if we have scores from zero to 101, Including that zero, there are a hundred possible scores to be on the final. Okay, but to guarantee that at least one has more sees the same thing, we always have to have that additional one to it. So that means that I must have a hundred and two students to guarantee that at least two have the same final, the same score on the final. Keep in mind this is a guarantee. It might be that everybody makes a hundred. Okay, but to guarantee it in case they don't, you always add that plus one, and that's that pigeonhole principle. This brings us to what we call the generalized pigeonhole principle, which says that if n objects are placed into k boxes, there is at least one box containing at least um, the ceiling of n by k objects. And so let's quickly look at this ceiling function. This is what we call the ceiling function. And the ceiling function assigns a real number, x, the smallest integer that is greater than or equal to x. 
So for instance, if I have 0.5, the ceiling of 0.5, it is the greatest integer, the smallest integer that is greater than or equal to this value. So that would be one. Okay? If I were to do a negative 0 0.5, and this hey, the one that is greater than or equal to would be zero. Okay? And we can have something like 3.1. The ceiling of this function would be four. So the generalized pigeonhole principle, if we apply it to this example, among 100 people, there are at least nine that were born in the same month. Okay? If we were to do this calculation, sorry, darn it. Sorry, if we were to do this calculation here, we get 8.3 repeating. And so that ceiling would give us to nine. So if I have 100 people, at least nine were born in the same month. Okay? So we're gonna use this generalized pigeonhole principle to look at a couple examples. So A, how many cards must be selected from a standard deck of 52 cards to guarantee that at least three cards are chosen from the same suit, okay? So just, we'll come back to B. This is remembering there are 52 cards in a deck, all right? We have four suits of cards, and the four suits are hearts, diamonds, clubs, and then spades, okay? And there are 13 of each card. So we're not including any jokers. So there are 13 of each of these cards. So the 13 times four gives us the 52, okay? So let's assume, gonna go to the solution, that um, we have four boxes, one for each suit, okay? So four boxes for one each suit. If we use the generalized pigeonhole principle, we'll have to do what is the ceiling of n divided by four cards, okay? Because of the four suits. So the n, how many of the n cards, so the n is what we want to find, excuse me, of the four suits, okay? So at least, we know that at least three cards, we want the number to be greater than or equal to three, okay? So what are we doing? Hold on. So for at least three cards, Oh, sorry. For at least three cards of one suit to be chosen, we want this ceiling to be greater than or equal to three. So our question is, what is the smallest integer n that would give us this value? Okay. So let's um, see what we would have. To do this, we're gonna use this formula here. Okay. n would be equal to this two okay, is the smallest number that is that is less than or equal to this three that we have, okay? Sorry, that is not clear. Let me take that off, okay? And so two is one less than that, okay? This is the four suit, so that is this divided by four. And whatever number that is, eight, okay? We need to add that one for the pigeonhole principle. So let's just imagine if I chose eight cards, so again, if I chose eight cards and each one of these is a suit, this is hearts, this is um, diamonds, clubs, I'll just write it, and spades, okay? So if I chose only eight and they were chosen in this form, then it's only two of each card. I would have to have one additional one, okay, to, to, to guarantee at least three are from one suit, okay? If I choose any less than that, I'm not going to get this guarantee. So again, this is always gonna be the integer that is one less than this value. This is going to be what we're dividing by our four. This is our four, our kind of our pigeonholes. And then the pigeonhole, we gotta add one additional to it, okay? So we have to choose nine cards to have at least three from one suit. Now let's look at question B, which says, how many must be selected to guarantee that at least three hearts are selected? Okay. So again, remember what we said, there are 13 of each suits of cards, all right? And so there are 13 hearts in the deck. So there are 39 cards, that's the 13 times the other three suits, okay, that are not hearts. 
So just imagine if you choose 39 cards, right? Imagine the worst case scenario is that I choose the 39 that are not hearts. So to guarantee to have three of hearts, I got to do three additional ones to this 39. So that's the 39, excuse me, plus the three additional ones, which would give me 42 cards. Okay? Now keep in mind, this is not the generalized pigeonhole principle. This is just using mathematics to figure this number out. Again, you can choose 39 cards, which are not hearts. Imagine if you just chose those first. So to guarantee, okay, you have to choose at least three more. Now, you could have chosen three hearts at the very beginning. That's going to be your first three cards, but it is not guaranteed. So to have the guarantee, we have to use choose the 39 and add an additional three. And so we have 42 cards that must be chosen.